Mm. All right. I guess I'm doing it. You guys have asked for it. You're all spoiled. But let's see how this goes. <laughs> so we're going to talk about... Dungeons and Dragons. We're gonna talk about Shards of Hyperion. For any of you who happen to have stumbled across this video who are not playing in my D&D campaign, that is the world setting that we are playing in and my players don't like to read. So we're making videos. So episode number one, this is going to be on Great White Divide, specifically the city, one of the two cities in the Great White Divide, uh, Icehelm. Icehelm is located on the western part of the world, on the Great White Divide. And it is uh, about um, a thousand miles north of uh, Viantor. So straight up from there and about another thousand miles south of that is um, Arathia. So just hopping up towards the equator itself. So the Great White Divide, coldest place on the planet. It is a massive wall of ice. Uh, Ice Helm is located directly there. It is one of the uh, canals that connects the North and the Southern Sea. So anyone that wants to trade goods or travel from the North to the South who doesn't have the use of portals is going to need to be able to go through this um, territory. The reason it's called Ice Helm is it actually uh, exists within a massive ice, iced helm, uh, <laughs> a massive um, helmet. It's actually the helmet of Thrym, the god, patron god of the frost giants. He left it there when he left the material plane eons and eons ago. And um, it was, I mean, Thrym's a big guy, but he's not big enough that you can have an entire city inside of him. But the helm that he had was enchanted to grow with his, um, grow with his expected growth on the material planes. Giants uh, never stopped growing. Um, and that's actually true with the giants in this world. They, the more ancient they become, they just continue to get larger and larger and larger. The only thing is they don't live forever. Um, giants on the material plane right now, they'll live a couple thousand years. Um, the long, most longest live of them will live a couple thousand years, like the storm giants. They'll, they'll live about the same as, um, elves. And then they end up dying, but they continue to grow. Well, Thrym was the same way. So his helm, when he left the material plane, Thrym is about 30 feet tall. Uh, so he's a big giant, but he wasn't like ungodly huge. But over time, his helm continued to grow and it continues to grow to this day. So it is to the point where you can have an absolutely massive city of around, uh, around 3 million people that all is inside of this helm itself. So the city of Icehelm is a free city. So it means it is not controlled by a king or an emperor or the council of guilds rules the city itself. So uh, these are all shop owners and landowners that are able to be a member of this council. Everyone has one vote in all council decisions, but the weight of your vote is determined by the actual amount of money that you bring into the city itself. There is a massive calculation there. The only independent group in the entire city is the Accountants Guild. And their only responsibility is to verify transactions that happen within each business and each guild. And that determines the weight of each vote that these individuals have. So currently right now, the ruler of the council is a um, Earth Genasi named uh, Kalisha Teladoro. She's one of the free guilds, and that's something we're gonna get to into a, a second. And she is uh, one of the most powerful individuals in the city itself. She has two main businesses that she essentially has a monopoly on. One of them is a fleet of ships that bring in lumber and supplies to bring crates and packaging. So she creates boxes and uh, pallets and skids for shipping uh, materials in and out, which is very important in this city because that's pretty much what the entire city exists for. It is a canal. There's just a lot of movement that happens through here. So, it, and it's, it happens to be a port for both the North and the South Sea. So there's a, a huge amount of business. So anything that gets damaged needs to be replaced um, in the city itself. She's the one that essentially will end up inevitably be the one that ends up making this for you. 
Uh, the other thing that she owns is all, uh, she holds the city charter for medicinal purposes. So any clerics that want to set up a temple to their god and offer healing for individuals needs to pay her a commission on that. Anyone that um, sets up just a regular hospital or regular doctors that don't use magic, they also need to set up um, a sign an agreement with her and she gets a portion of all of their sales. So she has a monopoly on that, uh, which makes her an extremely powerful person because everyone needs medicine. And anytime anyone gets hurt or sick at all inside the city, she gets paid. So despite being uh, literally the coldest place within Hyperion, uh, Ice Helm itself is actually quite toasty place. So there's a vast series of vents and ducts that uh, blast through warm air. And due to the dome structure of this and um, Thrym's helm actually has, all of his armor had incredible insulation because he's so vulnerable to heat that his, all of his uh, armament was actually insulated so that he would be less pervious to um, fire at base attacks. So because of that property, the inside of the helm itself can maintain heat extremely well. So despite it being about negative 40 degrees Celsius outside, just out in the Great White Divide, from anywhere from negative 40 Celsius down, I and mean, it gets down to close to 90, negative 90 degrees Celsius, so extremely cold temperatures. Uh, despite that, it inside is always, a com so always slightly actually on the warm side, maybe not even comfortable. Um, basically 100% humidity, somewhere between 26 and 30 degrees Celsius. So it's like you're down south in like Louisiana or, or Florida or something like that all the time inside there. So it's always kind of muggy inside the city. So all shop owners are members of the guild, um, are members of a guild, and with those guilds uh, bring money, uh, bring votes and whatnot. So shop owners, as a member of their guild, they have votes within this um, council of guilds that makes decisions for the entire city and, and everything. Another big thing, because this is a free city and uh, money is power, crime lords are a big, big issue. There are dozens of minor crime lords all over the place, people trying to shake someone down for, for anything. But there are three main um, big guilds that, that really are, they call themselves guilds, but they really are just crime syndicates. There are three major ones. You have the Ashborn. Ashborn, these uh, individuals are in charge of uh, shipping and they actually own the canal itself that goes through the heart of the city. So any ship that wants to go from the North to the South Sea and wants to use this canal has to pay them their fee that they charge to get through there. And this also allows them to um, smuggle materials in and out. They'll say, well, we'll let you pass. You have to take this down to Badalyn for me or else we're not going to let you through or we're going to find issues with your paperwork that may keep you here for a year or two or 10. So they're able to use that in order to manipulate um, manipulate trade situations and really give themselves a lot of money and power. They also have the, the Belkin. So the Belkin, they are in charge of um, power utilities. So running water, electricity, and they're also in charge of um, trash disposal as well. Basically a lot of the jobs, plumbing, electrical, and trash disposal. A lot of things that people don't necessarily want to deal with, not the most glamorous things. This allows them to have a lot of leverage because if you're not willing to side with them on something, they may just happen to make all of the electrical electric elementals that are keeping your neighborhood up and running. They may happen to go down or go missing. So they're, uh, they're able to use that power for a lot of leverage. Um, so the icebreakers, the last group, they have uh, control, basically a monopoly on construction. They hold the um, city permit for construction. You're not able to um, really build things without their approval. And a lot of times if you want to build something, they're going to say that the city permits are requiring that you have one of their workers do the construction, even if it's something you wanted to do yourself. So they're able to hold up a lot of things that way and things are not allowed to develop without their approval. So they have a lot of control as well. I think so all of these um, Crime syndicates, they are involved in um, drug trafficking, weapons trafficking, the normal stuff that you would associate uh, crime syndicates with as well. All of them are known to do this. But um, one of the issues is that there is no centralized police within the city itself. So all police are 
controlled and owned by the neighborhoods from which they serve. So it's kind of like everyone has their own private security and there is no centralized police. So actually fighting crime and corruption is pretty much impossible from an independent standpoint. The only way to do that is to um, really to try and catch them doing something illegal in the sense of how their numbers are being generated. So if you're able to prove that um, they're inflating their incomes through with the accountant, Guild, then you're able to get them in some type of trouble and you can get retaliation. Or if you get a majority of the council to vote against an individual uh, syndicate, you can pass down crimes that are determined completely by the council. But considering the fact that about 40% of the council controlled by these crime syndicates, it's uh, found to be very, very hard to, um, to actually keep them in check. Uh, part of the issue with that is that all the crime syndicates, instead of fighting against each other, they have their clear defined lines. Uh, they, they don't really step on each other's toes too much just because they know if one of them falls out of line, then they will not have the power to defend themselves. So lastly, uh, with Icehelm, other may be asking the question, well, why hasn't any, considering the importance of this dock, uh, it's one of two places that you're able to go from the North and the South Seas. Uh, and it happens to be the most advantageous location-wise. You'd have to travel a vast portion of the world to get over to the east to go through that gate. Um, why hasn't any nation come to conquer this place? Well, two main reasons. They, well, they have attempted to. But even with the issues that Icehelm has uh, with the, the free guilds, those are the individuals who are not involved in the crime syndicates, uh, they would rather deal with the crime syndicates than actually be ruled by a king or a queen or an emperor. They, they really do value their freedom and the fact that they are able to do whatever they want as long as a majority of the people believe that what they are doing is okay. Uh, they don't want someone coming in, laying down arbitrary rules, taking off their young to go fight in wars in faraway lands. They, they want absolutely nothing to do with that. And due to the vast riches of this city, they have been able to bring in massive amounts of mercenaries to fight any wars that um, pop up or any invasions that have happened. The other thing is Ellis Helm itself is extremely um, formidable. Get actually trying to attack the city itself, it's in a very good location. Uh, coming in and battling from the sea, you're dealing with the elements out there. Extremely cold uh, situations. Uh, ships can get uh, frozen in the ice very, very easily and you need you know, icebreakers to literally come out there and break open your ships so that you can get through um, and get your get your men in and out. So it has been attempted to be conquered several, several times. It's never, never gone well. Um, so that's, that's part of the issue. Frost giants often attack the city, often to no avail, but they are always plotting or scheming some way to try and um, try and harm the residents of Icehelm. And so it's not uncommon for frost giants to make attacks on ships that are going through. And this is another reason where the guilds can, uh, specifically the Ashborn can get a lot of money from this because they will say like, hey, we'll let you through, but you're gonna need protection. And if you don't pay us that amount of money, then we're not going to protect you through and the ice giants are gonna come out and kill you. So about this might be a little hint as to where you guys may have washed up last time. So. If you have any questions, uh, always you can ask me in the comments or Discord. Uh, if you are new here, if you are someone who does not play D&D with me, and you have any questions about the world, you're always I'm always willing to talk about it. Uh, I've been creating this world for about three years now, and um, it is uh, it's a lot of fun. So I will talk to you all later.